Now that we are well into fall and winter is quickly approaching, the days are getting shorter and running in daylight is becoming harder. Wazelle's premium reflective collection is designed with runner safety in mind. Both highly visible in the dark but subtle in the daytime, thanks to the tonal reflective print that only shines bright when reflecting the light. From tight shorts, jackets, and tanks to accessories like hats and gloves, with Wazelle's reflective collection, you can stay safe and stay seen. It is dark here in Cleveland where I've been running, so I just love Wazelle's reflective collection. I'm a big fan of the firecracker tights. The bird pattern is so cute, and they look all over sparkly at night. To check out the firecracker tights and the rest of the reflective collection, go to wazelle.com slash collection slash reflective, or even easier, click the banner link at the top of the Hear Her Sports website at hearhersports.com. Hello, everybody. Thanks again for tuning in. This is Hear Her Sports, and I'm your host, Elizabeth Emery. In today's Fast Track episode, we'll be talking a bit about coronavirus with professional Dutch road and cyclocross cyclist Lucinda Brand. This is a special treat for me. I became a huge Lucinda fan after spending the winter obsessively watching every cyclocross race possible. In the show notes, I've included links to some of those races. With no sports to watch live, I recommend cyclocross, which is super fun to watch. They're action-packed and only 45 minutes for the women and an hour for the men. Global Cycling Network offers free viewing of most of the major series. World Cups are available through the paid service NBC Gold. I want to give Global Cycling Network a particular shout out because their coverage is free and the commentary is excellent. They often have women commentators, although I wish they did that even more often. In any case, Marty, the main guy, is doing great work. So this past week, I've been wondering how Hear Her Sports fits into the current sporting world. On one hand, I wish I could just keep on as before to maintain some sort of normalcy. On the other hand, I want to focus entirely on the pandemic. There's probably a good balance in there, which is what I'm aiming for. You can help me out. I'm interested to know what's occupying your thoughts right now, and if there's anything sporty that you're curious about in particular. Send an email to elizabeth at hearhersports.com or leave a message at 725-BE-BADASS. Well, let's get on to the show. Lucinda Brand just finished the cyclocross season with Telenet Balois Leon and was beginning the road season with her team Trek Zegafredo. As she and I discussed, the women's team has two female directors, Ina Yoka Tutenberg and Giorgia Bronzini, both superstars in their racing days. It's only recently that former pro women racers have been able to get this kind of work after retiring, so this is a really big deal for the path towards greater equity. Lucinda talks about her current thoughts of the extensive race cancellations and how she's tackling training with uncertainty. She has been a professional rider for 11 years. On the road, she's won four Dutch national championships, GP de Plouet Bretagne, three stages in the Giro d'Italia Femminile, and the World Championships Team Time Trial. During this past cyclocross season, she won three World Cup races, Namur, Grand Prix Eric de Vlaminck, and Grand Prix Audrey Vanderpool. Welcome, Lucinda, and thanks so much for taking the time to be on Hear Her Sports. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. Let's start with the coronavirus, because we're talking right in the thick of things. What's your mindset today, and what's your mindset with the state of racing? Yeah, it's a lot of chaos going on in the whole world, of course, with this virus and the mindset have to be changed a lot. It's not that easy mentally, of course, but um, yeah, when we look to the news on TV, then of course, sport is not so big, actually, (laughs) and there's so much more going on. But yeah, for sure, it's not easy when you train for all these uh, races and you're focused on it. And actually, my shape was already good also. So then, yeah, it's not easy to skip everything out of the calendar. And yeah, let's getting back to basic training, actually. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm not minimizing the disease, but we all do have to continue, hopefully, eventually <laughs> doing what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We somehow need to try to continue what we we used to do, um, even if it's not easy to do. And I think it's the best for the economy to continue uh, as most as possible. For cycling means, uh, and and in sport general, means just only training and not having a real goal already because we don't know how long it will take. Right, right. And I gather from your website that you're not a huge fan of training. So how's that been? Yeah, that's true. Uh, (laughs) It's never easy for me to, especially without a goal and yeah, 
I always make it much nicer when I can go somewhere, uh, especially if it's training for a longer time. So that, yeah, discover a little bit places where I haven't been yet. But for now, that has to be discovering my own country, I guess. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it will not be easy, but um, yeah, everybody is in the same place. So right. we all have to deal with the same thing. Yeah. You know, you brought up a point I hadn't even thought about because we don't know when it's going to end. You don't really have a, a date for a goal. And that's hard when you're training for sport. You know, you always have a goal when you're supposed to be super ready. So how are you and your coach managing that? Yeah, yeah, that's basically the most difficult thing uh, for now, actually. So we just got the instructions to try to train like in the winter, just basic endurance with some small sprints and stuff like that in training to keep the intensity load low and just keep our basic level. Uh, we don't need to focus too much on food also, just like uh, <laughs> they called it uh, winter weight. <laughs> and yeah, and then as soon as we know when the program will uh, return then they all gonna sit together who is gonna do which race and then we will know what will be the next goal and then we still have some weeks of course to start the intensity but yeah uh, nobody will know how long this gonna take it can take only the restrictions from now so that's three weeks but it can also take maybe two months right. nobody will give an answer on that now so for myself i just don't put a date on it and keep also my mind ready for the worst that that it will take a very long time and I think that's mm -hmm. the best way to approach it <laughs> otherwise you get disappointment on disappointment and uh, yeah that's not the easiest thing for nobody I think and how are you maintaining connections with the team by that I mean your other teammates but also the management and all that stuff so, yeah, the management just keeps us updated with the information they got by email. Just, uh, yeah, the most important things like also that they going to discuss how they can get as much uh, races as possible in a smaller calendar or uh, having the season till end of November, for example. And mm. then I have some phone contact with my trainer because, yeah, he's also in his own country, of course. So <laughs> it's just... <laughs> giving feedback on my training and uh, the other way around and some whatsapp contact with my teammates yeah we're dealing with all the same thing some teammates are ready for much longer uh and like italy they, they are in the worst scenario at the moment already for more than two weeks at home <laughs> mm -hmm. and you know the olympics are coming up so do you have any idea how this is going to impact that? I mean, has the Dutch team been selected or is that still supposed to be happening in the future? Yeah, that, that's a complicated thing. So we just got a communique from the Olympic Committee, uh, the, the international one, that for now they're not going to cancel it just because there is not enough information and it's too early to say then already that it will not continue at the date it's planned. But... For the selection from the Dutch cycling team, men and women, we should show our form in the spring classics, so and mm. the end of April. And then in the beginning of May, they should pronounce the selection. I didn't got any information that they will not decide it in May. So if they just going to decide in May, then they, I guess they will just use results from the past <laughs> but i also can imagine that they're just waiting what the olympics gonna do if they keep it on the same date or that they just wait a little bit longer for information about that and then giving information about how we can try to select but um yeah for now it's yeah just a little bit unsure so i keep it yeah for me it's now just how it should be also without the virus only then without the races to show myself. Right, right. I mean, it's interesting, too, because everybody's going to wear this break differently. I mean, some people will come out of it great, and some people are really going to struggle, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, I think we still should try to face it a little bit the same as in the winter. So then you also see, of course, a little bit difference between the riders. 
yeah, that's normal, I think. Right, right. Well, let's move on to some more fun topics. Yes. I want to talk a lot about cyclocross because I watched a lot of the races. Luckily, the coverage has gotten really great, both of the men's and women's, so that's super exciting. Can you give us a sense of how hard it is to ride the World Cup cyclocross races? I will try to <laughs> to, to explain how hard it is. I mean, unfortunately, it's basically Dutch, but uh, the level is very high. So I hope also the other countries can uh, match up with us uh, coming season a little bit more. But uh, yeah, it, it's a combination of so many things. It's not only physical, it's also the technique and uh, also especially when we all stay together tactics of course and yeah the the last season the level is really really high and and tight which makes uh yeah, actually a cyclocross race is always already that you go for like for 45 minutes all in and uh, so you're basically totally empty in on the finish line but yeah, when you're really fighting for the win still with three, four, sometimes five girls, then uh, you maybe can imagine that you're even deeping deeper <laughs> to get that win. And um, yeah, that, that's very painful, actually, sometimes. Yeah, I mean, is it like constant pain and suffering from the starting gun into the finish? Uh, it, it, it's definitely not easy. Uh, of course, it depends a little bit on the course. If you're in pain from the start till the finish, and of course, also a little bit on the form of the day. But an example like Namur, then um, yeah, there is not a place you can recover because it's or you're climbing or you need to be so focused in the downhills and the technical parts. There is no time to really take it easy. But if you take the World Cup in Zolder, then there are a few parts very important. And there are also a few parts where you really can say, OK, let's take it a little bit more easy and tactic. And I'm going to sit in the wheel, for example, or just also there is a little bit longer flat road in the finish line where you can take it a little bit more easy. So you can take a little brief. But of course, that's also a little bit depending on the race situation. I mean, when you're in front. And they're chasing with three riders. You have no time to take it easy, of course. Uh, so that's depending a little bit on, on different courses. But yeah, I think for like 80%, you're suffering all the time. Yeah. Do you ever get into sort of a flow state, either physically or mentally, because, you know, you're sort of learning the details of the course? And Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times with the World Cups, I'm doing a reckon already the day before. So I really try to get the course in my head. And of course, it's very helpful that year after year, there are not that much changes in the course. So you get to know it better and better. But the fun thing of cyclocross is that the course itself, like the corners, how, how the underground is, it will change every time again. So even if you know the course perfectly, when you're on the start line and you face the first corners, and then you know how it is and even the next round it can be different again and it's just because it can be raining or it can dry out because it stopped raining or because another rider has made the mistake so the line is wrong mm -hmm. at the next time so there's <laughs> that's the fun thing of it that it's never the same and so of course you can yeah, get yourself in a kind of a flow knowing the course very well, but you always need to take in mind that they will change. Because the start is so important, what are you doing for a warm up? Yeah, actually, I'm riding on the loose roller. So the ones you also see in track racing. Mm -hmm. And I always first have just the easy warming up. And everything is a little bit on high cadence. And then I will do some sprints. And sometimes I will try to do like a little bit uh, run up. So then I go every time a little bit faster and faster to really most important thing for me is that, that I'm warm, that I'm sweating so that I'm really activated. And I'm mostly busy like 20, 25 minutes with this. And um, the difficult thing of it is like, to stay warm afterwards because you always need to be on time at the start area because of the call up and then you're standing still on the line. So 
we always a bit early stopping the warming up, but then in the finish area, you also can ride up and down till the co-op starts. And then I'm doing some real sprints on the road still. Mm. So how much time goes between when you get off the rollers to when the race starts? It sounds like it could be quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it is. I try to to really make it tight, but you can't make it too tight. So it's basically already like fifteen minutes or something. Right. Sometimes a little bit more. Yeah. Right. Uh, I, sorry, I want to go back to, about learning the details of the course. Can you explain how you learn the course? You know, like the details of the course on the day or during the pre-ride. Like, what's going through your mind? What are you looking for? How does that go? Sometimes I look how other riders do first or already in the race or just uh, when someone else is doing a reckon. Sometimes you discover some different lines because it might happen that you're not riding alone and can be handy to have a different line or different ways of approach. So is it faster to run or can you better stay on the bike? Those kind of things. If there is a really difficult point, I mostly gonna ask one of my coaches, Sven Nice or other coach around there from the team to to help me out and to see if they have a better option for me, a better line. Sometimes you can better take a longer line, which is easier than taking the shortcut, which is harder. Those kind of things are very important. And I also try to see how's the wind and does that change anything for my start, for example? And um, yeah, those kind of things you're busy with when you're doing the reckon. Mm-hmm. And is this a learned skill or did you go into cyclocross because you were good at this kind of thing, figuring out the course and whatnot? No, yeah, I still have, uh, I, I still can learn a lot. It all started with going with the flow, but once you're getting better, you need to get it more serious as well. So yeah, I can still learn a lot and I'm also training on that. But I think I can read the line sometimes good, but I'm also not afraid to ask help in it. So this combination is is working well for now. And going to the world championships, did you all on the Dutch team have a team tactic? I mean, did you plan on getting away as a group like you did? (laughs) Um, We didn't really have a team tactic, but um, we did discuss like we can't... um, we, we we cannot um, ride behind each other if we still have some concurrence there. So then it, then we decided it might be the best solution to try to get rid of everybody and then we could fight with each other. So then we did uh, agree on just helping each other to make a gap to the concurrence. Mm. That, uh, yeah, basically, all, I don't know if it's really a, a tactic thing, but um, yeah... Uh, Somehow it is because then you just can uh, play the race you're used to and you don't uh, need to sit in the wheel while you're feeling good, for example. Why are the Dutch so good? (laughs) Yeah, of course, I get a question very often and I don't have the real key for it. Uh, I do know that in the Netherlands we have, I think, a good way to to get in the sport so we have a lot of clubs and a lot of clubs have also an own trainings area which is close from normal traffic so it's a very safe environment and you can do it from very young age and you also can race on a very young age you can start racing on your eighth year and you also can decide in what kind of level i mean you can just do a club race which is basically with a smaller group also. But you also can decide to do a national race and then you need to travel a little bit more through the country. So that's also divides a little bit the level. And yeah, because you can do that already from your eighth year till, yeah, whatever call it. I think that makes it more interesting to stay in the sport because you can just ride on the level you like to race. Uh, if you're mm-hmm. not so fanatic, it's not sometimes not so nice to race uh, national races because you need to travel a lot and that, that takes a lot of time and uh, other riders are maybe a bit more fanatic. So then it's nicer to just stay close to home and do a club race. And then maybe sometimes mm-hmm. later you get more interested and you're still riding your bike. So you can still start to be more fanatic. Mm-hmm. But if you didn't have a choice, you maybe 
quit already and choose for a different sport. So I do believe that that's really helpful, those things. And that's maybe missing a little bit in other countries. But I'm not sure if that's the only reason. <laughs> it sounds like a good reason. And can you clarify? So each club has a dedicated cyclocross course that, I mean, not each club, mm. but many have a dedicated yeah. cyclocross course. Yeah, I think quite a lot. And for example, if I see my own club, we have a very nice facility to give cyclocross training. Uh, we have a lot of uh, lights around also because, yeah, in the winter it's early dark, of course, so it doesn't make it easier to give a training. Uh, but it's also open for riders in the area. So if you're from another club which doesn't provide this kind of training, you're welcome to join our trains. And um, I think... In that way, you also collect the riders together and they start to also play a bit with each other, which make them stronger. Right. That sounds great. Yeah. I can see why yeah. that would make a big difference. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's really fun for sure. And how do you manage to do cyclocross and road back to back? I mean, in normal circumstances, you would be heavy into a road season right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's not super easy. It's something you really need to plan. And you need to be very honest to yourself. I always think that uh, physically it's not the most difficult thing because you can uh, really make good training plan and adjust and stuff like that. But mentally, you also take a lot of yourself. And maybe that's even uh, counting harder, which can make it more difficult. And I always try to be honest in that way to myself, like, hey, how do I feel and do I really like it in this moment or do I really feel like I need a break? And on that way, for example, I choose to start my cyclocross season last season much later than I did before because I just was a little bit empty and I needed a break longer than I was planned to do. So then I decided to start later with the races. And actually the training stuff, yeah, that's not so hard to combine because cyclocross training is very intensive. So you have your intensity training already, which you can use for the road as well. And also cyclocross training, you still need to train endurance, which you need for road racing. Right. right. So that way, I think you can combine very well. But of course, it's always like one of the two disciplines I'm not doing a full season for in races. If you count the days of racing, for now, I'm not doing so much cyclocross races. And I still keep quite a full uh, road program. And yeah, that's also something you always need to look into. And um, yeah, that can change in the future. You talked about, you know, needing a mental break. What do you find draining about competing because i know that you do like racing you talked about how you like racing maybe more than trading yeah 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 i definitely like racing much more but um you also need to be very focused in the race of course and you also need to travel a lot so it's of course the full package which can make it more tiring <laughs> so you're taking a break usually after the road season yeah uh, yes and actually i also during the road season so that's a big change from when I was just doing road racing. Then I really had a long break after the road and then started my winter training again. And during the road season, I maybe had in May a little break, but that's it. And now I, if you look from January, then I do a train camp already in January. So I have a little bit less races in that month. And then after the World Championships, I take first a week a break and then start training for the road season. But straight after the spring, I have a break of two weeks in May, mm -hmm. which is a little longer than I maybe normally should do. And then I'm focusing on the summer. But then on the end of the summer, I take a break again. So let's say like in the end of July, I take a week again off and then I start again. So what I did last year after World Championships, I take again a week free or one and a half before I start on the road, on the cyclocross season. And then in 
the end of November, I'm not having a break, but I do have a training camp. So then I'm out of competition again uh, to, to really get some good training in. So my breaks are a bit more spread over the year now. Hmm. That, that's sort of an interesting way to do it. Yeah, I like it. So what do you like about racing? I like the game, actually. So <laughs> just being fanatic. I'm, I'm super fanatic. And especially on the road racing is really the game. It, it's so much going on in the race. And I really like that. that that's, yeah, my heart is there. <laughs> the game, yeah. that, that's really the thing for me. And yeah, working together with your teammates and thinking what's the best way. And yeah, in cyclocross, you do it more on your own, these tactics and how you should approach. But you're never bored in cyclocross because you constantly have something coming around. And otherwise, you're in a tree, I think, or something, you know, or in a ditch. <laughs> <laughs> you're so good at really going hard, and particularly when times are really tough. And I notice that, especially in the cyclocross season. And you like racing. So, you know, afterwards in post race interviews, you're always very cheerful. How do you maintain that sort of level of fanaticism that you're talking about when it's hard? Well, I sometimes do have a fight in my head <laughs> by just giving up. But then I'm like, yeah, but why? I mean, maybe they get something and then I'm benefiting of it again. And um, maybe it's also coming a little bit that when I was younger and racing, I never won. And I always had to fight to even sometimes stay in the group, for example. <laughs> I wasn't that good. So then... You also learn to fight to to get a result, and uh, maybe that helped also a little bit to keep that mindset also in the races. That I just don't want to say when I finished that I didn't try everything to do better than I did, and maybe that's something in my head that I I when I really tried everything, then I can't be disappointed on myself actually, because I did everything I could. Maybe I could do things better, but I did try it. And maybe that's something what's then in my mind that I just should keep going. That's great. Before we wrap up, I want to ask you about women in cycling these days. And I ask that in particular, because you have two women directors on your new team. Yeah, yeah, that's really special, and I really like that. Uh, it didn't raise so much to it them yet, but I think women in cycling is getting bigger. So the peloton is getting bigger. Different jobs are more and more also filled by women. Also in the men's teams, actually, I do see some female swannies, for example. In the Dutch Federation, we even have a female mechanic in the cyclocross team. So even there, it's growing a little bit. And, cool. Uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. I re also was really excited when I heard it. Um, so yeah, I think we are in the good way. And we should just keep up this way, actually. Yeah. Was the two female directors being with your new team, was that part of your decision making? No, it wasn't. The reason, no, I never have been thinking actually that way. For sure, I was really looking forward to work with them both because I've been racing with them or against them. And I was always as a rider looking up to them. So then it's, of course, uh, really nice if you can start working together. Mm -hmm. But it, it wasn't helping the decision to change the team. It will be interesting to see if you notice any difference having women directors versus male directors. I'll be interested to hear that later. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess there will be some difference. I mean, I think men and women are still different approaching things. So there definitely will be a few things different. But I can tell you later when we did a few races, if it's also important difference. Right, right. Well, anything that you would like to add before we sign off? Um, no, no. I think, yeah, I really like to, to chat a little bit about these things. And actually, uh, I think I told a lot about myself and I hope people going to watch all our races. Now it's more and more on TV. So I really like to hear that, that you also watch it so often. Yeah, the coverage has been really terrific and getting better. So I, I really, I agree with you. I hope more and more people watch. Yeah, that will be great. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks so much. Thank you. Cool. 
Thanks for joining this week's Fast Track. Share Lucinda's stories with friends who've been wondering how athletes are handling the competition cancellations. Connect with us on social at Hear Her Sports. Sign up for the newsletter and let us know what you've been doing to stay active this past week. What are your longer term plans? Email elizabeth at hearhersports.com or leave a message on our hotline at 725-BE-BADASS, 725-222-3277. Our stellar design is by Agnes Studio and music by the band Gold Mines. Till next time, keep a distance, but stay neighborly. Bye-bye. Whether you are a brand new runner or you've been running for years, there is always a new way that running can change your life. And this is what the Planted Runner is all about. Being planted also means you're ready for growth. You can start exactly where you are right now and get better. I'm coach Claire Bartholik, and I've coached hundreds of runners of all ages and abilities with science-backed training, nutrition, and mental strength techniques. And on the Planted Runner podcast, I'll share it all with you. You can be a better runner at any age. I'll show you how.